This is NICU Babies Parent Support with Katherine Whitaker, a podcast from Hand to Hold, a national nonprofit that provides free personalized support, resources, and community before, during, and after a NICU stay. My conversations here will focus on education and personal stories with medical and hospital professionals, counselors, therapists, and NICU moms and dads from across the country. Whether you're preparing for a NICU stay, you're currently there, or your months and years past your stay, you belong here. The NICU is hard. We're here to help. I'm your host, Katherine Whitaker, the mom of six children, including my very own NICU baby, and I'm so honored you're here. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the podcast. So this month of mental health, June, I'm really enjoying our guests. I hope that you took a lot from my conversation last week with Regina in regards to either couples counseling or individual counseling. How can that help you navigate as the parent of a NICU baby? But today I wanted to shift gears a little bit and focus on mental health for children, specifically psychiatry. There is, um, there's a lot of talk about what is, first of all, what's the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist? We're going to dive into that. But also if my child is seeing a psychiatrist, am I, did I do it wrong? Is there something that I should have intervened earlier for? Um, as NICU parents, sometimes I think we ask ourselves those questions a lot. Did I cause this? Am I the, am I the reason for this? Um, and how can I help make it better? So I felt like visiting with a child psychiatrist would be a great way for us to dive just a little bit deeper into mental health as we really seek to find some good answers this month of June. So I invited one of my friends who I think has amazing perspective, but he also has an exceptional social media presence. And I have learned a lot. And y'all, I'm six kids in, but I have learned a lot from Dr. McNall. Dr. McNall has quickly become a trusted voice in both the parenting and the mental health space. When he's not at his clinic, he's engaging with his community on social media or on his PBS show, Cause for Hope, by helping families navigate parenting and the digital age. You're going to love him. So let's get to it. Well, Dr. Mittenhall, thank you for joining me. I am so excited. This has been a month of mental health, so you seemed like one of the perfect guests to ask uh, to come and visit with all of our listeners. But I think my I'm going to always start with this question because I'm always curious how people sure. get to where they are. So how did you get from a degree in biology to a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist? Thanks. That's a really good question. Um, and it, I, I will say it wasn't linear because I wasn't sure that this is the specialty that I wanted to be um, a part of necessarily. I knew that I wanted to go to medical school and that the idea uh, seemed like it'd be a really good fit because of my heart for people and just uh, and loving to hear people's personal stories of, of struggle, but also helping them to the place of, of victory. So I think there were a couple of kind of formative things that happened along the way. I mean, when you're in medical school, you get to do a little bit of everything. You know, you get to do a little surgery, uh, spend some time on the oncology unit and taking care of, uh, you know, uh, patients with cancer, working with diabetes, working with just just about everything. And so um, slowly but surely, it became apparent to me that, one, I just really enjoyed working with uh, kids a lot. I mean, I, I felt like it was probably the easiest um, on switch for me um, was to walk into a room uh, of, a, of a kiddo who's maybe having a tough time. And uh, and even when the team left, I'd be the last one kind of hanging out, making jokes, uh, asking them about their their lives and, and trying to um, encourage them on to, you know, to take on really tough challenges or for us to kind of figure out together, you know, how we could help things to uh, to, to be better than they than they were. So um, so as I was near, as you uh, enter the last few years of, of medical school, you're encouraged to decide, all right, it's time to apply for residency and, and what do you want to do? And I was sitting with my um, preceptor and just said, uh, he asked me, you know, if you were on an island and you could only read one, you know, magazine of a certain specialty, what would that be? And it turned out that psychiatry was it for me, that, um, that I had actually um, predetermined that I'd probably do a pediatric subspecialty like surgery, um, but uh, but he helped me recall. Actually, that's where the the joy is in, in sitting with kids and, and hearing about their internal lives. And so that 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 got me here to child and adolescent um, and adult psychiatry. So I still see some adults, but mostly the ones that I see are in the context of you know working with uh, a child and and their struggles. 
Sounds like a good mentor. Um, so for those that don't know, what is a psychiatrist? We'll start there. Sure. So a psychiatrist um, tries to help um, kids and families to understand some of the emotional challenges that a child might be having and to evaluate whether they meet criteria for what we call a disorder, meaning that obviously we're all wired for, you know, um, joy, sadness, um, you know, uh, struggles with distraction or, or inattention and those types of things. But there's a level at which those things can be significantly impairing in the developmental life, in the academic pursuits, and the relational connections um, in a child's life. And so we kind of sit with families uh, for an extended period of time, looking at both their developmental history and the context of what's going on in their lives to see, one, if they meet criteria for a disorder, and then two, um, also evaluating, are there any medical things, too, that can look like or mimic some of the struggles that we often see in kids. So for instance, you know, I might have a kiddo who's struggling with um, some pretty significant anxiety. And so um, of the things that we might look at, we might also rule out that there's a thyroid issue or, you know, um, or a vitamin deficiency too that could mask or kind of um, simulate, um, you know, some of the things that we might be seeing in a, in a young child. And so, um, and then from that information, we make a treatment plan or think about ways to help kids if they do meet a criteria. And that might mean, you know, therapy, that might mean medication, that might mean a combination of things that might be diet, nutrition, sleep. So, um, so really, it kind of runs the whole gamut. But that's in a nutshell, kind of what a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist does. That was well done. That was a that was Thanks. a big question that I asked you. So, what, what's the difference between psychiatrist and psychologist? Because I think sometimes people like to use those interchangeably, but I don't think that they can be. They're not. They're not. They're not interchangeable. Um, and um, what's great is that there is great complementarity actually between these two worlds. So, what we share is that you know we're both um, primarily interested in the brain and how that gives expression to the emotional lives of uh, the young people or even adults that we that we see. The biggest differences are, you know, psychologists have training in doing some formalized assessments like, you know, IQ and processing speed and and some things that actually a, an MD um, doesn't doesn't do. And one of the other distinctions too is that um, is that is that medical component. So looking at, you know, are there other you know, biological contributors to a way that a child is feeling. Those are investigations that we might do. Or um, if I have some hint that, uh, you know, maybe there's something neurologic um, that I might need to order, you know, an MRI. That's something an, an MD would do, but that a psychologist um, wouldn't do. And both can do therapy, although traditionally psychiatrists do a little less of that because we're also doing kind of medication management at the same time. Um, and, uh, and psychologists don't, don't prescribe uh, medications. Um, they tend to refer to us if there's uh, someone in need of, of those services too, to help them uh, get to victory. That's extraordinarily helpful. As I'm listening to you, I'm like, okay, that, no, I don't think I've had anyone explain it quite like that. Um, you know, I think <laughs> if you're, um, if you're the parent of a NICU baby, I mean, they certainly, sometimes walk out of the NICU with lingering challenges. Sometimes those are resolved in the NICU, but sometimes they persist. Um, I guess as a, as a parent, Dr. Mittenall, when you're looking at your child develop, and I'm talking as they get into, we've got our NICU baby is now 13. Um, what might okay. some of the things be that you might look for that you would say that maybe needs the intervention of a psychiatrist? So as yeah. your NICU baby navigates sure. all those challenges, some of them are normal, but some of them I think sometimes yeah. need some assistance. That's a really good question. And and um, the first encouragement that I often give parents is to trust your gut. If you think that there's something that isn't quite, you know, going well, or, you know, again, life is full of struggles and, and challenges. And we know that our kids may encounter those and will encounter those actually along the way. But if your sense is, you know, I think that my my child is having a harder time at, you know, whatever that is, learning or um, some of the fine motor kind of development or um, or I think, you know, retention of information and maybe getting a little bit more commentary from the teacher about helping them to, you know, stay on task. And and uh, and I keep hearing this at each of the parent teacher conferences. You know, those are reasonable uh, things to to kind of investigate further and at least ask the question. I think sometimes parents maybe are concerned, too, that. It has to be serious. It has to be traumatic. It has to be, you know, life or death before we um, see someone in, in child psychiatry. And so um, I, wa I want people to know, you know, we're, we tend to be a, a gentle group <laughs> um, and very sensitive to understanding a child's temperament. 
um, how the family life is kind of constructed too, because sometimes there can be things in there um, that also um, add to the challenges that kids see. So, so that's the first. The first is trust your gut parents. You know, if there's something that that really seems um, amiss and it's hard to put your finger on, and despite your best efforts to help your child be victorious in this area, you still continue to see them struggle. That's a good reason for us to, you know, uh, to get together and to think about it together and to see if we can't come up with some solutions that that um, that really make a difference in the life of the child. The other is. Um, if there are some things that it felt like your child was covering, uh, conquering or mastering before, that um, as they are ascending the levels of challenge in school and work and peer relationships, that they're just not, um, it doesn't feel like they're keeping pace or maybe they're regressing and things that you thought that they had already uh, kind of mastered, those also can be indications that, all right, we need to look a little bit deeper to help better understand and then hopefully come up with a, with a plan that can help them be um, be successful. Um, it just is true that there are certain things that we can't tell without them being um, stressed. I remember, uh, you know, asking my dad when I was younger, seeing cars in a car garage and, you know, well, why do they keep, you know, turning it on and, and, and driving it around? It's like, son, you know, you can't, you know, I won't hear the noise if it's sitting at, at rest. And so sometimes uh, there are just challenges. So when our kids are in our home, you know, we might be doing things just as loving parents that are covering for, that are helping to frame, that are making easy, you know, things that they might otherwise be challenged to do. And so it's not until sometimes being in school or being at that level of challenge that we get to see, oh, my goodness, this is a real challenge for you. Um, how can we help, you know, be there or better understand this so that so we can take this on together? I'm sitting here nodding because I'm like, first of all, that's a great analogy. But secondly, I'm thinking of my own kid and it wasn't until we started putting him in certain situations that we realized, oh, I don't think that that, like, I think he needs some extra help. So that's a, that's a great yeah. analogy. I love it. Um, so if you feel like, yes, psychiatry is what we need to do with our child, we think that's the the path that we need to go down. What are some questions that you should be asking of yourself? Is this um, a psychiatrist that can help our family. And then once you get there, what are some questions that you should ask of the psychiatrist and their care of your child? Sure. Uh, so I think the first is, um, the first in terms of internal questions are, you know, what are the things that I think are developmental milestones that my child isn't reaching? That will help to kind of clarify, you know, where it is that you might need to spend the most time when you're sitting down um, with the psychiatrist. And, and again, having having you don't have to have all the answers or everything kind of laid out and i certainly wouldn't encourage you know you going on google and trying to pre-diagnose before the before dr the google visit. yeah You're right yes <laughs> the temptation is strong for all of us actually yes. <laughs> myself included um but uh and so and so less time on google more time just uh really kind of thinking deeply about your child and what are the situations and circumstances where you see the biggest uh the biggest challenge and then also how the family Family tends to respond to those challenges um, that have been either, you know, minimally successful, unsuccessful, or just kind of neutral. Too, those are a lot of the things that that a psychiatrist, a skilled psychiatrist, is going to be spending a lot of time with you talking about. Um, you know, where where are those struggle points, and what has that looked like, and what have been the past kind of intervention, so to speak, um, that the family's been trying to employ to, to help the child to be um, successful. So in terms of questions for the um, psychiatrist, um, there really aren't any any bad ones. I know parents are often apologizing before they get yeah. the words out of their mouth. And I'm often like, hey, you don't have to qualify this at all. Um, I am I'm here to hear what is puzzling uh, to you, because sometimes the question isn't necessarily you know, um, is this diagnosis um, right or not? But can you explain to me how it is that that this expresses itself in the way that it does? You know, when I see my child in play and they're really um, inflexible with rules and and not really kind of getting it that you know they need to relax and and uh, maybe hear the other person's perspective or being able to participate in imaginative play. I mean, even even our diagnoses don't always make clear why in the world um, when kids are trying to you know, execute or make friendships that it looks the way that it does. And so having an understanding about, oh, so this is how the anxious brain thinks. And so it can come out in these you know, varied ways. Or sometimes this is how you know, a kid who's experienced an early trauma might react to certain things. And uh, sometimes they don't know. You know. Sometimes it might be a cue of something that they've experienced, a smell, a sight, or sound that they can't even fully place 
that, you know, that, that caused them to regress or caused them to struggle in a particular way. And so there really aren't uh, any questions that are, that are off the table. So if you still have questions, that means that they are, are questions to be had and, uh, and they deserve some, some time and, and consideration in the visit. No, those are really reassuring. I mean, I'm thinking I can't speak for all NICU parents, but I know that sometimes you carry a lot of guilt. You know, did I cause this yes, or am I exacerbating yes. this? And so I think mm-hmm. that that assessment of saying, can you explain to me why? Because I think as parents, we tend to want to understand what can we control? What can't we control? And am I helping yes. this or um, am I interfering with this? So I hope that yeah. gave some a lot of parents that were listening, a little bit of comfort knowing that it's a line I think that we all struggle with, certainly as uh, as parents of kids who struggled in the beginning and may still be struggling. This podcast is produced by Hand to Hold, a national nonprofit, but we're more than simply a podcast. Be sure to download our app, join one of our support groups or find one-to-one support, enjoy counseling, find loss and bereavement support, participate in a peer-to-peer mentor program, or check out our news, articles, and family stories at handtohold.org. All of that is at no cost to you. Hand to Hold's mission is to provide personalized support before, during, and after a NICU stay to help ensure that all NICU families thrive. Sometimes there's a stigma um, of, oh, you're seeing a psychiatrist, or oh, your child is seeing a psychiatrist. What are some myths that you think we should bust about that stigma of psychiatry? Yeah, I think... Um, that's such a great question. One, I think um, that I'm, I'm hoping that we are approaching a time. I know that it doesn't bust a, a stigma, but a, approaching a, a time in which you know we can talk about our emotional lives too and the help that we get for that, and not have to feel um, that that's something to be uh, to to necessarily hide or not be able to share with with friends. I still hear that from families too. That you know it's easier to say my kid has a busted leg than it does to say my child is struggling with anxiety and and yes. um, and we really need some help with that you know um, but I think but I but I think we're kind of approaching that so number one is um, I think the assumption that every solution has a medication attached to the end I think that is something that parents maybe are are really concerned about or thinking in the back of them, their minds and I know sometimes it's part of what um, delays maybe their connection to seeing um, to seeing a psychiatrist, um, thinking that that's the only option. And so um, I can't think of a scenario in which even when that's been indicated or helpful, that it's the only thing, right? So um, yeah. often we really are trying to think about the the whole child. And so um, and so I often am reassuring parents and um, and kids too. Hey, there's no there are no skills in a pill, right? So there are probably things we're going to have to adopt and work through and come up with strategies for, you know, along the way. And so nothing exempts, you know, human beings from, from kind of doing that, uh, doing that together. Um, the, maybe another uh, stigma too is, uh, is parents thinking that it's all our fault, right? You know, yeah. Yeah, at the end of this, you're just going to say, you know, I should have been better <laughs> at, at everything, yes. or I should have known all these things, you know, from the get-go. And the truth is, right. There is no manual, guys. I mean, even even in psychiatry, right? Our manual that we use to help us with diagnosis is a diagnosis of disorders. But what does the ordered child look like, right? We don't have a book for that, right? That that is uh, that's that's something that's more you know art than than science in terms of us helping children to be kind of successful in the world that they um, inhabit. So it's not all your fault. Um, now, are there things that we can change? Sure. And that's that's going to be true about any family system, you know, about how we respond uh, to kids and, and what types of things, you know, relieve and take away some burdens that are unnecessary for them and what kind of things are kind of healthy challenges that we just need to be alongside them, helping them to grow through. So I think those are probably the biggest two that I um, that I hear about. And certainly if there are others, too, that are on your on your mind, I could answer those as well. But yeah, no, I mean, I think that's predominant. I too. think that's great. Is I think sometimes we we hear about or we see a child who has a similar diagnosis or a similar mm-hmm. challenge, but yet it manifests itself very differently, and that's where the doubt creeps in. Of Right. Did I do this right? Did I cause this? Like, what's going on here? So we are uniquely yeah. created. Therefore, we respond to the same diagnosis in a unique way. So that's right. thank you. That's thank right. you for reminding me of that as a mom. I have other <laughs> kids. So yes, that's good. That's good. Um, so uh, you 
You provide a lot of encouragement and advice on social media. So if people aren't following you, I'm going to link to all that stuff in the show notes. But um, what um, what are some of the things that you think might be most helpful for people to dive into, particularly maybe if they have a child who has some medical challenges or just is trying to figure out how do we navigate this? I know you have some good resources on there, but what are some that you want to share with everybody that you think yeah. may be most helpful? Yeah, I think I like having a chorus of other people who kind of understand a little bit of the journey. And I like what you said earlier, too, about, you know, how it looks or how it presents in my child may be different than another. But at least it helps me sometimes as a parent to realize I'm not crazy. You know, I'm not blind. I'm not I'm totally missing the mark. And so I think if you can identify a a really smart, you know, loving community, really, um, with whom you can kind of share this struggle or burden and certainly you know, the, if, if that happens for you locally and you, and you have that kind of um, IRL, as my team, teens like to say, you know, in real life, if you have somebody there, I think, I think that's, you know, that's, that's certainly um, priceless. Um, but I do think, yeah, on, online, if there are, um, are some good kind of communities or, or, or groups, and that's part of, you know, my impetus actually about, about being online is, is to hopefully grow kind of communities of families who can say, hey, you know, my kiddo has ADHD. It's really hard, you know, parenting that comes with maybe some unique struggles um, as well. And what are people doing that they found to be helpful or just things that they tell themselves or remind themselves in those moments where they're more vulnerable to being frustrated or kind of having a reactionary moment rather than, you know, um, recognizing, hey, this is hard for you. It's also hard for me <laughs> as a parent. Um, how can we do this? Uh, how can we do this in, in love? And so what that particular thing might be for a, for a family may vary based on, you know, the struggle that they're, uh, that they're feeling. So, um, so I, for instance, I think this podcast idea is, I, I, this is wonderful. It's wonderful in terms of getting a community that, you know, from the outset, these are families who are, are sensitive to recognizing kind of the struggles of their kids. And so they tend to be even more attuned to, you know, what's going on in the life of their, of their child. I mean, I, I, as a, as a dad myself, I can say, you know, there are things that sometimes people say, Hey, did you know, you know, one of your kiddos, I think I, I observed this and you think, Oh, okay. I was, I was going to just shrug it off as one more thing for them to, you know, kind of persevere uh, through. And I think that's a, that's a particular gift of families who have started out with some early life challenges um, because in terms of intention and connection and attachment, those, uh, those bonds tend to be really, really strong in a a particular way. And I think that's such a, that's such a gift, actually. I think that's a gift. I had a doctor ask me one time, he said, are you in the medical community? And I said, yes, I went to NICU school and he just shook his head and he said, all you NICU moms are alike. So I I do, I do. (laughs) I do think that there is this uh, hyper awareness after having been in the NICU that that you are aware of many things that were unfamiliar to you. And it sort of opens a whole new wing of your heart to be very attuned to when your child is striving and doing great things. And then when your child is struggling and needs some assistance, I think we tend to be, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I do think thank you for validating like you're not um you're not being overly sensitive you were just very hyper aware because your child needed your advocacy and your voice in the very beginning um i always ask this question of my guests because it's my favorite question um what is your best advice to a parent who is seeking psychiatry for their child yeah so the first is um to be reassured that, hey, um, whatever solutions are brought up or come to, I mean, ultimately, you know your child best, right? So you are in the driver's seat to say yes or no, or I think this is a good fit, or we'll take it in stride, or maybe we'll think about it, um, do a little bit more reading. Can you provide me some additional resources? So it's not a high pressure sale. It's not a, you know, a push to, to make a, to make a change right now. The other thing too, is that you are the most sensitive, you know, um, detective of what's going on and whether an intervention is being successful or not. And so um, I often tell uh, parents, you know, if, if what we're striving for is, you know, academic, uh, you know, excellence in addition to, you know, their emotional lives intact and really healthy, you know, connections in their world. But there's something about what we're doing that makes your child, you know, lose their sparkle, their shine, their personality. I'm going to listen to you, even even if all the signs of, you know, straight A's and whatever are are working well, because um, there are important things about uh, a child's development that uh, that aren't quantifiable in that in that way. And so being able to make sure that we're preserving the whole child is really the most important part. And the person who's going to know that best is you, the parent. 
I love that I asked you on here. I would love to say it's because I'm such a good host, but it's because you're such a good guest. Dr. Mitnell, <laughs> no. thank you. No, no, no. Thank you for um, your excellent you. advice. And I love that you, while I have no doubt that you serve the patients that you see IRL in real life um, in your own practice, <laughs> I love that you share your knowledge online and in social media. You're a great resource. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And thank you for what you do as well. I'm, I'm always in awe and, and, uh, and grateful that we get a chance to chat. Um, through this medium. So thank you so much, Catherine. Of course. Well, wasn't he exceptional? I knew he would be, but he absolutely delivered. In today's two-minute take, there's a lot. There was a lot that he said that resonated with me, but also what a great educator. I would have expected that from him, but I thought he did an excellent job. The thing that that I loved the most that he said, which was sort of a light bulb moment for me, was the car analogy that you don't know how a, a car is going to react in a certain situation until you turn it on. Did we fix that? Did it take? Uh, what's that noise? And so it's not until we put our NICU babies into new situations, right? So in the early days, it was remove this oxygen, take out this feeding tube. How are they going to react? What are they going to do? And as they get older, how are they going to react when we put them in their first play group, when they have their first temper tantrum, when they have their first challenge, you know, when they're in therapy, uh, occupational therapy or feeding therapy? What are they going to do when they go to middle school or how are they going to react in high school? So it's not until we put them in these situations that we begin to see what our kids are made of, what their challenges are, and also what their gifts and abilities are. So Dr. Mittenhall, thank you for reminding me as the mama of a NICU baby that it's good to put my child in a new situation. And then we can assess and say, hey, are they going to self-regulate and figure it out? Am I going to be able to help them? Or are we going to have to go outside of our home and employ the services of a psychiatrist or a psychologist or whatever that may be to help them get over that next challenge? Because our NICU babies are no notoriously amazing at meeting a challenge and then finding their new normal, their new place. So I loved my interview with Dr. Mittenall. If you are not following him on social media, you should be. He's Dr. Mittenall. It's M-I-T-N-A-U-A-N-A-U-L. Sorry about that. Dr. Mittenall. So you can find him on all the social medias, but I do think that he gives great advice in this digital, digital age of how do we navigate this? What do we do? And then if you feel like after watching some of those, assessing your own situation, that you need someone in real life to help you navigate that, don't be afraid to ask for help for your child. That is a good, very good thing um, to help them move to the next place. So I hope that you're enjoying our mental health series this month. I, I absolutely am. And we have some more great guests coming. So don't go anywhere. I will see y'all next time and we'll dive a little bit deeper. Thanks y'all for listening to NICU Babies Parent Support. Every parent and every experience is welcome here. If you are a NICU parent and you're finding yourself in need of support, please download our app. You can find it in the Apple Store or on Google Play, Hand to Hold. And if you love today's episode, you can share it, you can subscribe, and you can most certainly review it. We would love, love, love your reviews. It's how we reach more NICU parents. Thanks, and I'll see you all next time.